indeed. Why? Because nobody wants to relive the last 20 minutes. Okay, including me. <clears throat> okay, so um, screen share is up. Let's go ahead and dig in. Yay, finally. It's like it's only halfway through the semester, but here we are in chapter one. Um, that's sarcasm, just in case you're wondering. Um, so let's go ahead and get started. So first of all, when we take a look at uh, general biology, uh, we want to first start off with some basic principles, right? So some basic concepts, some basic ideas. Uh, we always start off with kind of laying some of the overall groundwork. Right? So there's a couple of core ideas in biology that we want to sort of track through. And uh, these are core ideas that we'll kind of touch on highlight sort of all the way throughout the semester. Um, and uh, we kind of just keep going, you know, kind of they keep coming up basically, right? Um, a lot of concepts are um, favorites, <laughs> if you will. Um, but there's, biology has a lot, it's like, I always think biology is like a big, like a big tapestry, right? And so a big tapestry has lots of threads woven into it. Um, but when you take a look at a tapestry, no one thread is more important than another, right? And so when you look at biology, especially as a discipline, sort of philosophically, when I look at it, um, I have, I admit, I'm a little bit of a purist when it comes to this sort of thing. But when I look at these biological concepts, I look at it with respect to balance, right? Like a big tapestry, like all the ideas are important, but there's no one idea that gets to steal the show. Now, the reason why I say that is because there's a lot of biologists who allow them to run away with the circus, allow themselves to run away with the circus a little bit, right? They allow their pet idea or their favorites, uh, which they, it's human, right? We all play favorites. Um, and I have my favorites as well, but I try to keep that balanced with everything else. Um, but sometimes they run away with their favorites. And uh, we say crazy things like, um, and I'll say it too. You'll hear me say my favorites. I'll, I'll rah, rah and cheer my favorites. It's just human. Um, but um, one of the big favorites that uh, we run into is obviously probably one of the core threads that we usually associate with biology and that's evolution, right? And so that's kind of one of the big core ideas and certainly an important one, um, however, not the only one. And as a matter of fact, uh, even though I got my degree in evolution and ecology, I would argue actually evolution is not the most important um, of all the ideas. Now that's, that's potentially heretical, uh, what I just said, um, but I don't really care because everybody else is wrong. Um, it's only heresy if you're not right. Um, if you're right, then everybody else is wrong. And that's what this case is, right? So the idea here is that there's other really important ideas. Like if you're wondering who my favorite is, I admit, I'm gonna lay it out there from the front so you can know, you know my bias from the beginning is I'm a genetics person. Um, and uh, genetics is kind of a little later to the game in biology, which is the reason why um, a lot of people aren't genetic centric like I am, but as you get into genetics, you realize that actually gen genetics is the epicenter of biology. Everything radiates out from genetics, including evolution. Right? Evolution is quintessentially a genetic thing. Um, but there are some uh, other ideas, obviously, that are also very important, and we try to keep uh, an even keel of balance. Now, one of the things that uh, we do and the, what the evolution does a great job of is explaining diversity, right? So how do we have all of these different organisms out there? Um, and, uh, and there's some similarities between them, right? But there's also some differences. Now, the one thing you'll also notice, and I don't know if I mentioned it uh, with you guys, um, I kind of mentioned it off and on, or I forget who, it's a blur, by the way, the week is a blur for me. It will be a blur until May. So if I look like I don't know where I am, it's probably true. Um, but um, I like to say I'm not afraid to poke the bear. Did I use that one? Yeah, this is a bear poke. I don't really care. Um, a lot of my colleagues um, 
uh, disagree with me on a lot of things, but uh, it's always good for spirited discussion. Listen, um, one thing you need to know first, of, uh, first out is I, uh, being a scientific purist, right? Um, one thing I always do and I try to keep in front of me is you never fall in love with the dog that you have in the race, right? Don't fall in love with your idea because in science, unlike other disciplines, you have to maintain your objectivity, right? Don't sell out. And part of the, and so I don't. So where I see, and, and all of these ideas have strong points to them. A lot of them have weak points to them, right? These are areas where we're still kind of working on it. We're still trying to develop them. We are still trying to collect data and things like that. Evolution is a perfect uh, idea, right? The reason why I like to pick on evolution is because there are some of my colleagues out there who literally will sacrifice small animals to idols in the name of evolution. For them, it's more of a religion than it is science and that belongs somewhere else, right? Science is beautiful for what it is, but you have to look at it like science, okay? So in areas where uh, evolution is very strong and robust. It does a great job of helping us understand things. There's also areas of evolution because it's a really big idea with lots of different facets to it. There's some weak spots, some areas that we're still trying to work on. We're still trying to pin them all down. And there's, there's always some, some, uh, some caveats, if you will, and to all these ideas, right? Um, and so it's always helpful to make sure that you're honest, right? That you're intellectually honest with yourself in ourselves as scientists about, well, how well do we know this, right? I mean, is this just an explanation, that yarn spinning, or do we actually have data where we're pretty confident about this, right? So that's the sort of thing we wanna make sure we parse because there are a lot of, of these ideas where we kind of help, that helps us describe the world around us, okay? But some of them have their challenges and I'm not shy to point out those challenges. Because if we aren't honest about it, we're never going to get stronger in the idea, right? If we keep worshiping evolution, then we're never going to actually improve it and add data to it and increase our understanding so we understand actually how it works. And there's a lot of really cool things that have happened over the last 20 years that really kind of has shaken up the way we see things in evolution. That's really fascinating. And it kind of forces us to sort of go back to the drawing board and kind of reimagine how we think it all happened. Um, and those are really good things. That's a good thing. Those are <laughs> moments of growth for us in science, yes. Yeah, kind of more like the philosophy of science and kind of how science has changed. Uh, no, uh, that is a fascinating topic though. Um, but we don't really get too much into that. That's kind of more of like, um, kind of like a history and psychology of science, um, which is actually help. I mean, we'll have some discussions in there because you can't, you can't not talk about how society changes in respect to science, right? Because it does change the way we do things. Um, and that's helpful. One of the things I like to do in science is um, I'm a big history buff. So a lot of times I will actually do a little bit of a history lesson so that you understand exactly how science and society collided together and how that mold, that kind of melting together kind of created society as we now know it. Um, and it continues to happen. Science continues to collide with society and it continues to change the way we live. Um, and that's just how we grow, right? So that's just kind of the way it works. Um, so there'll be little pockets in there, but not like a full presentation of it. So what is all this diversity that we're trying to describe? Well, the diversity that we're looking at is basically all these organisms that we have around it. And by the way, a lot of, a lot of times, um, a lot of people would be like, you know, because you're used to diversity, right? I mean, a lot of you guys actually know more animals than uh, people did 100 years ago, right? Um, and it's like you just sort of take it for granted, right? So we, we know a lot, but Back in the day, like as, as late as, you know, in the 1800s, uh, when Darwin actually did his famous trip on the Beagle, uh, we were pretty stupid. I mean, we knew some animals, but there was a lot of animals out there we had never seen before. Um, and it was a lot of animals. 
That's the reason why and Darwin himself by trade was referred to as a natural historian which is essentially like what we refer to as a zoologist, right? So you kind of, and what the natural story did basically was go out there, find crazy looking animals, kill them, which is what you did. Uh, we don't do that so, so much anymore, but right, you kill them and then you bring them back to the lab and it's like, look at this crazy thing I just found, right? Now, have you ever seen something like this? It's like, yeah, no, this is like weird stuff, right? Like that's what they did for a living. And that's what Darwin did. Right. So for the first time, I think that was an exhaustive around the world trip that he took. And he basically collected all this stuff. And then that's what he's got here at home. Right. And of course, the idea is how do you explain all this? Right. And that's kind of where the idea of diversity comes in, because you realize. Um, it's a touch screen. Hold on. So you realize that there's all these organisms out there, right? And they all look different. They're all kind of doing stuff. And, and so one of the things you want to do is you want to kind of start sorting through all this. This is where all of these, um, all these ideas came in. And so when you take a look at all this diversity, you see all these crazy different organisms out there of all different types. And of course, what do we want to do? We want to organize it. Right, that's one of the first things you do. That's what we always do, right? We kind of try to make sense out of it. We kind of put it in a category that we can sort of say like, okay, so you, all you guys over here, you kind of look the same. You kind of look the same. You kind of look the same. We kind of start to separate it all out, right? We're very good at that, by the way. Segregation to us comes naturally, right? Because that's how we sort of identify uh, differences for our purposes. So that's kind of what we did. And that's exactly what Darwin did. Um, and the other natural historians, so you had all these creatures. And one of the first things you want to do is like, well, let's organize all these things into sort of similarities, right? And so this is what they did. Now, now what we have is the Linnaean system of taxonomy, right? So that's basically what we've got now. And what you did, uh, the way you do taxonomy is basically, this is the classification Of organisms by morphological similarity. <clears throat> and this is kind of what you did in the 19th century, right? You basically said, well, you guys all kind of look the same. You guys all have feathers, right? So that's a morphological similarity. So we're going to put you in the feather crowd. <clears throat> you guys all have, you know, uh, you guys all look like cats or something like that, right? So we're going to put you in the cat-like sort of group. And, and you sort of segregated these guys all up, but it was according to morpho morpho morphology, right? <clears throat> and so that's the way we did things for the most part originally, which is one of the reasons why I kind of take the stance I do from the get-go, which is this idea of being critical, kind of reimagining um, evolution, not necessarily reimagining it, but kind of updating it, right? Because honestly, dwelling on the fossil record is kind of boring, honestly. This is kind of what we did in the 19th century, right? We organized things by morphological similarity. We stared at rocks for a while. We looked at things that have been long since dead. And that's all we had. That's all we had for a good hundred plus years. Now, since we have the human genome and we're in the genomic area, it's like the reason why I try to encourage students to sort of let go of your traditional view of evolution and ask new questions of evolution is because now that we've got a genomic era, all that information is kind of recalibrating and sort of reimagining this whole process in what I would argue a actual, an actual more accurate way, right? Because evolution itself would be a genetic phenomenon. Yeah, go ahead. The, for what? For the new system for? Well, we still use the Linnaean system. Is that the one? Yeah, it's a name. Linnaeus um, is the guy who originally came up with it. 
Um, and we still do that. I mean, we still do that a lot. So like most of like your taxa groups that you're looking at are largely the main for the most part, uh, but you do see molecular versions of it. Um, so you can do taxonomy just by looking at gene sequence and things like that. Um, and sometimes they don't agree, which is really fascinating, which is the reason why you kind of have to reimagine evolution. It's like, just because they look the same doesn't necessarily mean that genetically they are the same. And what do you do with that, right? So those are really fascinating questions that you have to sort of flesh out. And that's the reason why I say, don't fall in love with your idea, maintain your, your objectivity and be willing to update it because new stuff is coming in like all the time. And it's really exciting actually. So this is taxonomy. So this is basically our um, desire to basically categorize all these organisms and literally, it's kind of like a game of 20 questions, right? Have you guys ever played 20 questions? It's simple, right? You think of somebody and you got 20 questions to figure it out, right? But what are the nature of the questions? Yeah, they're binary, right? So there's two, there's two outcomes, right? It's either this or this, right? So you ask questions like, are you um, male or female? Of course, that one's trinary probably, right? Because you could say, neither <laughs> right so there's the third one in there but still though you know something then right but typically speaking historically it'd be like okay i'm male or i'm female whatever um and then you kind of ask another question right it's like are you famous yes or no right um are you a singer yes or no are you an actor yes or no are you a politician yes or no so the idea is after 20 questions if you structure your questions correctly then you'll be able to zero in on that person and guess who it is right that's exactly what you did here. So you have binary questions. And typically you have a series of questions. And the first question that you ask is this. <clears throat> Are you prokaryote or eukaryote? Whatever that means, right? So there's two types of cells in the world, two, that's it. Prokaryotes, which typically harbors things like bacteria and archaea, little guys, pretty simple. Evol on an evolutionary uh, frame of, of things, these are the more primitive cells uh, believed to be the first uh, arrivals, if you will, of life, something prokaryotic this way. Eukaryotes are us, more complicated, not necessarily multicellular, but they can be. The unicellular ones are more complicated. They have things like a nucleus, they've got organelles, which are little membrane bound structures that are designed to do particular tasks, okay? So they're a little bit more complicated. So you either are a prokaryote or a eukaryote, there's nothing in between. Now, if you answer this one, this sort of sits you out into the first level of taxonomy, which is the domain level. And that's what we have here. So you can see you've got three domains from this one. So you have archaea, who is a prokaryote. You have bacteria, who is a prokaryote. And then the third domain is eukarya, and that's us, okay? Now then, guess what? Let's get more specific, right? Because if you say you're a eukaryote, have we figured out the difference between you and say a dog or a plant or a mushroom? No, those are all eukaryotes, right? So we got to ask more questions, don't we? So we ask more questions and we start asking more. So different types of questions that you'll run into like big ones. And I'm not going to do all of them, just kind of highlight a couple of big ones that you would run into. Like uh, one of the big questions you ask at some point in the system is, do you have a backbone? Yes or no? That separates organisms into vertebrates and invertebrates. That happens actually a little downstream. You're separating the mammals, or some of the animals, excuse me, into two different groups, right? So that's basically, do you have a backbone? Yes or no, invertebrates versus vertebrates. Um, if you're a vertebrate, so you could ask the next question, are you a mammal? Well, I don't know, am I? Well, what does a mammal do? It gives live birth, right, by definition. And it has mammary glands, right? 
So the question is, is that you? It's either yes or no. If it's no, then guess what? You're a non-mammalian. You could be reptilian who lay eggs. Or you could be confusing like monotremes, right? <laughs> who are mammals, but they lay eggs. Wild, right? What's an example of that? Huh? What's an example of that? A monotreme, platypus. That's the biggest one. There are other monotremes that do that, but platypus is probably the one that most people know. Um, right, so you kind of have this mammal. Now, not all mammals are the same, are they? You can ask another question. What do you eat? Do you eat plants? Then you're herbivora. You're an herbivore. If you eat meat, other animals, then you are carnivora, right? If you eat both, omnivora, right? So you have these different segregations. And eventually what's going to happen is you're going to get down to the last two. Let's do this one. Anybody know what Canis familiaris is? I can guarantee you some of you have a Canis familiaris at home. Yeah, not just any dog, your pet, the common house dog, right? Now, some of you probably don't have this one. Who's that? Canis lupus. That's yeah, a wolf, right? Notice they share the same canis, but this piece here is different, right? Um, some of you have this. What is that? Yeah, yeah house cat, right? So what we have here at the bottom of this taxonomy scale is the genus. And the last one is the species. Now, these two together are sufficient to basically pin you down specifically. For instance, Canis familiaris, you're a house dog. That's as specific as you can get. So you are, that is, you, you can't go any further than that. Now, technically speaking, in taxonomy, you can. Uh, and taxonomy is constantly growing, by the way. A lot of times students get this sort of view that taxonomy is static and we lay it down, but it's not at all. Um, we comp constant, we'll have subspecies oftentimes, we'll lump species together to create one species. Um, and as we learn more about these species, oftentimes we're constantly splitting them apart and we're lumping them together. It's constantly growing. Um, a good example of that in this area was when I went through ornithology at UC Davis. I'm a bird person, obviously, so it's ornithology. Um, but there was a species of bird there, one of my favorites, called the rufous-sided towhee, which we actually have around here in Denver. Actually, they're everywhere. But the rufous-sided towhee, after I graduated, was actually split into two species. So now it's not rufous-sided towhee. They've split to eastern towhee and spotted towhee. So what we have here in Denver is the spotted towhee. So they're like little black birds with black on the top spotted wings, little white spots in the wings, but this rufous kind of rusty colored side on their side. And look for them. They got red eyes. So they got black heads and like these blazing red eyes are really cool. Um, and they're ground, they like hop around the ground. They like to forage on the ground, um, look for them. But that's an example of where taxonomy wise, it's split into two species, right? Instead of one. Now, one of the things I like to sort of mention here as one of those things just to kind of keep in your mind, and it's very pertinent too, and, and I want to flesh this out because um, there's a lot of value in kind of understanding the facets and the complexities of, of an idea, is this concept of lumping and splitting, like, you know, splitting things apart or lumping things together and sort of reimagining them as we learn more about them is something that happens constantly, actually. Um, and not only that, but this is something that affects the way we think, at least specifically in a localized area, how we think about evolutionary change, right? Because the idea of evolutionary change is that it's a transmutation of species, right? That is one species to another species by natural selection was Darwinian mechanism. And of course, now we have mutation, things like that. We have six different mechanisms now. 
but the idea you have the change of species right over time that's the idea of evolution well one of the one of the wrenches that we kind of have in this that we have to always be very careful with and be intellectually you know uh, aware of is when we're talking about changes over time we always need to make sure that we have a full vetting and a full appreciation for what exactly we mean by a species right was taking the tohi and splitting it into eastern and spotted was that a case of evolution no the bird is the bird right so did the bird change over time yeah i mean it, it radiated right but I mean, is it actually a different species? Because we had it all as one species at one point, right? So that's kind of, it's a little tricky. It depend, depends on how you define species. And there's like six different definitions for species in evolution. And how you pick a definition will determine how your results come out, right? So there's all these different layers in the idea of evolution. A lot of times, just like when we hear about it in general, it's very whitewashed. It's like preschool evolution. Right. I mean, it's like sock puppet evolution, but evolution has a lot of really complicated nuances to it and twists and turns in it that are very significant. This is a good example of one. Right. If you're talking about change of species over time, you have to understand how are you defining species? Right. And and when when at what point, right, does it become evolution or versus just taxonomically rearranging things? Right. And so those are always hard questions. I don't know that anybody has a really good answer, right? We just try to do the best we can. And that's why it always changes, right? It changes because we're always working on it. And that's good because it gets stronger the more we work on it. So that's our taxonomy. So what are we, by the way? We are animals, yes, right? But what's our mammals? We are mammals, yes. Um, but what are, what's our species name? Yeah, homo sapiens, right? Homo is genus, sapien is species, right? So if you've ever looked at anthropology, you hear things like homo erectus, right? Um, homo is our genus, erectus is, um, is the species name, right? So that's kind of what, that's what those, that's where those words are coming from. Um, but when you get down to genus species, so we, we showed you where the top is, domain, we showed you where the bottom is, genus and species, uh, but there's a, few other steps in between. Here's what you want to do. You want to take a look at these, know them in order. It's easy. Let me show you what they are. As you narrow down, you go from domain to kingdom. How many kingdoms do we have? Yeah, right. We have four eukaryotic, right? And two prokaryotic. So archaea has a kingdom to it. Um, bacteria has the kingdom bacteria. Eukarya has kingdom protista, fungi, plantae, and animalia, okay? Those are the six kingdoms. However, you can ask more questions and narrow it down even more. From kingdom, you go down to phylum. Then you get down to class. Then you get down to order. Then you get down to family, then genus and then species. So when we say Canis familiaris, there's actually an entire laundry list of names that goes with all these other taxonomic levels. Does that make sense? That would be like every dog, but then you would go into like what breed of dog? Yes. Well, the breeds themselves are still all Canis familiaris, which, oh, okay. which I think is fascinating. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about that when we get to genetics. Um, because that really is an interesting thing that historically, traditionally in evolution, we didn't look at things that way. Um, but since kind of more modern genetic approaches, it, we, it kind of changes the way we look at things. It actually makes it more fascinating to be quite honest with you, um, how all this works. But generally, like when you're looking at, and when you look at an animal and you've never seen it before, right? And you kind of take a look at it and you immediately say, well, that's kind of, I don't know what it is exactly, but it's kind of like, it's kind of dog-like or it's like cat-like. Usually what you're doing is you're making a recognition. Usually that's at the family level. Like for instance, the family name is Canidae for dogs. Canids, right? All dog-like animals. 
So you have Canis lupus, Canis familiaris, right? That's wolf and house dog. Then you've got things like jackals, which are another one, another canid, um, you know, dingoes, right? Um, all these different types of canids, dog-like creatures. That's usually the family of dogs. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, kangaroo is, uh, it's a marsupial, but I don't know what its family name is. But um, uh, kangaroos and wallabies, and I think there's uh, koalas, I think, are in there. They're in the same, they're in a similar family. Um, obviously, koalas are a little uh, more distantly related, uh, but certainly all the jumping. And there's a couple of them. Um, there's a couple of different kangarooish um, organisms, and they're kind of part of the same kangaroo family. But they would be, because I don't know where the marsupial, which is pouch bearing organisms, right? Organisms that carry their young in a pouch. Um, there's a lot of different, very different types of marsupials out there. And I don't know where the marsupial taxonomy level is. I don't know if it's at the family level or the order level or a little higher up. But it's, it's probably either, it's either order or family. It's probably in around there. Um, it kind of depends on how they diverged. Um, but yeah, Australia is a challenge, right? Because there's all sorts of crazy stuff in Australia. Um, stuff just like, what? This, yeah, this is just like, you know, you take diversity, you throw a grenade at it, and you, that's Australia, right? I mean, it's just like all these random weird things coming out of there. So the way you remember this in order is very simple, but very tragic. for all you Felixophiles out there, Felidae. Um, this is sad. Even if you don't like cats, kittens are cute still, right? It's when they grow up, that's kind of where things change and you get a little different. Um, but kittens, I mean, most people like kittens, even if they're not a cat person, because they're just like little cute little balls of fur and claws <laughs> and sharp teeth. Um, but puppies are sharp teeth, where they start to on. Right, so basically drunk kittens playing chase on freeways get smashed. So you have domain, kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species. Okay. Notice as you go through it, as you go down it, you're getting more and more specific. This is the Linnaean system. Started taking things, putting them together by similarity, and then started to kind of separate, subdivide them according accordingly until you got down to the place where you could no longer subdivide them, right? And we still use that, uh, by the way, for the most part as our basic framework, okay? And, and nobody disagrees with that because it's, it's an organizational thing. It helps us to sort of categorize and make sense out of, out of our diversity, okay? Um, and that's not really, technically speaking, taxonomy is not really an evolution idea. It's just an organizational idea. Um, because it doesn't, the taxonomy doesn't explain, try to explain where everything came from or how it got there. It just sort of organizes it all and says, like, well, here's what I got. So here's what, here, here it is. Here's my organization of it. You guys now go figure out how it all came here. <laughs> That's kind of what they do. So they kind of, uh, it's a tool that we all use, but it doesn't really itself uh, say really much of anything. It's just an organizational tool. So um, one of the things that we noticed and this is the hard thing, by the way, right? There's, this is what makes this difficult because a lot of times, and one of the things, I mean, having a degree in evolution is one of the reasons why I like to talk about it and why I like to pick on it. Because one of the things that drives me crazy is there's so much going on in the idea that when I usually hear about it, it's just, it's so weak. <laughs> I mean, it's so thin um that it's like it does it, it would be better if they didn't even talk about it than to talk about it in such shallowness right because there's so much going on in it and it is difficult and it is complex it's a complex across the board right because living things are not easy um defining how living things work and how it all comes together and how it all came to be is a difficult fundamentally difficult thing 
it's a difficult thing to describe how something is happening while it's happening in front of you. Now imagine how much more difficult it will be to try to describe how something is happening when it happened millions of years ago or billions of years ago. And part of the thing and what makes this difficult, right? So trying to define how all this works is not only is it difficult already in real time, but the further back you go in time, the harder it gets to pin it down with certainty. And you see this actually, you'll see this in our ideas that are coming out. You'll notice that things that we are currently studying, we can feel fairly confident about, right? But as we start to go back and the further back we go, you'll notice our ideas start to kind of wobble a little bit because it's difficult to know exactly what happened four and a half billion years ago. Nobody was there. We're talking about in four and a half billion years ago, by which I mean the development of the first cell. Okay. When all this stuff was coming together, it's all soft tissue. It's not in the fossil record. Soft tissue does not fossilize, right? So there's no record of it. There's just teasing tidbits of kind of information and these oftentimes, the further back we go, we have to basically hypothesize, which is not a bad thing, right? And we kind of form models to try to help us explain, well, how could this have come about? Well, we form a model and a model, as it goes back, has to have good explanatory power. And what we mean by that is that when you have a model that you can't physically test, which by the way, is one of the requirements of science, which is always one of the reasons why I say, you know, always, review your caveats in evolution, right? If you can't test it, then it's a story, right? And it's okay if it's a story, but it's not science, right? It's a hypothesis, that's, that's fair, but it's not given, right? And so that's kind of what I always try to caution students, like the further back we go, the harder and harder it gets to discreetly know for sure exactly how it goes. And so what we end up seeing is a lot of different competing ideas. So like, for instance, for cell evolution, we see you know, multiple different versions of that, um, of how it could have happened. Um, each of them has certain amounts of explanatory power. That is to say, they have the ability to explain how we see things today, right? Um, and the more you can explain what you see today, typically the stronger that makes that idea. That's what explanatory power gives us. But in reality, because it was so long ago, it's almost impossible to know for sure exactly how it all went. There's a really good chance actually that we have it all completely wrong. <laughs> and it actually went down in a way that we haven't even thought of yet. That's actually pretty, pretty possible. Okay. There's a question back there. Yeah, anything that's soft is typically not fossilized. So, because fossilization requires um, mineralization, and usually we think of fossilization as bones. It's very rare, it's very difficult to find actual soft tissue. I mean, sometimes we'll see fossilized fish where you can kind of see a vestige of the skin and stuff like that, but that's pretty rare. Most of what you see in the fossil record is, or what was, bone. Um, and that's because you're basically doing a mineral replacement of the minerals associated with the rock, replacing the minerals associated with bone. And uh, it's kind of that petrification process. So it kind of basically becomes mineralized bone. However, that's actually even been turned upside down, which is one of the reasons why as a genomics person, I'm kind of more interested in what genetics says, not the fossil record. Because I don't know if you guys have Notice that no, know this or not, but there's been a recent discovery which has been absolutely jaw dropping um, from like a paleontol paleontological point of view, right? Because the idea is that when you're digging around in a rock bed and you pull out a T Rex bone, we are pulling out a rock, right? But apparently, there's some researchers who were working on T Rex in North Carolina, I think. Um, and she's well trained. I mean, she's like well connected to a lot of the evolutionary uh, folks as well. So we're not talking about a non evolutionary person. She's an evolutionary person, but um, she's finding soft tissue in these T Rex 
fossils. She found uh, blood cells. Uh, some people have been reporting finding collagen, which is your connective tissue. And as a molecular person, I look at that and I'm just like, what? This shouldn't be possible. Like at all, right? After 65 million years, which was when the last T-Rex was roaming the planet, According to the mineralization process, this should have long ago, millions of years ago, been completely converted to bone. So the fact that we're finding soft tissue in here is just jaw dropping because protein should not be stable over 65 million years. That is absolutely flabbergasting. It brings up a lot of questions. It's exciting. Because this is like one of those moments where we kind of think we get it all, got it all right. And then something happens and it's just like throws us for a loop. And we have to kind of go back to the drawing board and figure out, wait, what's going on here? What's happening? Right. What don't we understand that's happening? The other thing that's exciting to me is protein is not as stable as DNA. So could there be T-Rex DNA out there? Maybe if you're finding collagen protein, why not? DNA is more stable than protein usually. If you recover T-Rex DNA, oh my, that's, that's a game changer. You could sequence a T-Rex genome, all of a sudden Jurassic Park becomes less fiction and more fact. Is that where you guys were going with this? That's where I'm going. That's exactly what I'm thinking. Yeah. yeah, I want to see myself a real live T-Rex. I guarantee you, if we did that, we would probably believe, you know, the thing I love about Jurassic Park is remember when What's-His-Face was in there, um, and there's a moment, there's a couple of scenes when he actually did this, when he was like blown away because he's like, oh my gosh, they're actually doing it this way. It's like he was seeing it for the first time. It's like all the, all the training of his paleontology, he thought that this is the way it was, and he was watching the real dinosaurs do something, and he's all like, Oh my gosh, they're not doing this the way we thought at all. I bet you a hundred bucks they're, we're going to have those moments if we're if we if we have a T Rex. That's exciting to me. Shouldn't we have feathers? Um, depends on who you talk to. There's different fields of evolution that said that the uh, theropods were the predecessors to the birds, um, and some of them say no, they weren't. Um, so it depends on who you talk to. There's a bit of an argument going on about that one. Um, what well you can't because uh blood cells don't have nuclei in them um you could do that with mitochondrial dna perhaps uh, actually no you can't because they don't have mitochondria either but basically all the red blood cell is is a sack of hemoglobin that's all it is so it's one of the only cells one of the few cells actually in your body that don't have a nucleus it gets rid of it that's the reason why they only last for three months um, they only have a shelf life in your body for 120 days. That's the reason why your bone marrow is constantly making red blood cells and replenishing them is because they get used up. Now, how do you get DNA from your blood? It's the other cells that are in there, the white blood cells in particular. If they could find those, then maybe they might be able to find some stable DNA. That'd be awesome. That'd be cool. Yeah, no, that one, it's, it's so, it's really new. But I mean, I think, this, I think they just did this like within the last five to 10 years, I think. So it's like really new. Um, it, that's exciting. I mean, I've got questions. I mean, all kinds of questions. Now I'm all of a sudden thinking, wait a minute, this whole fossil record thing, are you trying to tell me that those are all bone and not rock? Because if that's the case, then wow, this could get really cool, like really fast. But yeah, I mean, who knows? It could just be some weird offshoot of mineralization that happened, kind of like mummification, where mostly uh, most of us will decay, but some of the mummies just hang on. Okay. Um, but yeah, so it, it depends. I mean, it could be because DNA is happy in water. I mean, it's polar. Um, it does no problem with water, so it could be. Um, We well, could, I mean, we, I mean, I don't know. The problem with testing water, like if you were to go out 
and test just like even just soil or just like the Cherry Creek or something like that or the ocean, and you want to say, is there DNA in there? You're going to see DNA in there because all the organisms that are already alive and they're just going through their life cycle and they're dying and decaying and all their DNA is going to be in there. So you'll see DNA everywhere. The problem isn't, are you going to find DNA? The problem is, are you going to find ancient DNA? And how do you know? That's the problem. I don't know that we have a way of determining like, you know, is this DNA because this organism just died and decayed right here? Or is this, you know, ancient ichthyosaurus or something like that? I don't know that we know how to say how old DNA is. But yeah, so there's a lot of challenges, but I love it because this happens, by the way, periodically in science, because we get to the place where we think we know it all. And I can get, and this is one thing I hate about some of my evolutionary colleagues, um, because they've definitely got, you know, the one thing I hate, the phrase I hate the most is um, the, the phrase science fact. It's a fact. It's like, okay, you have drank the Kool-Aid and you are a walking corpse laying down. Scientifically, you're dead, right? Because the idea is the second that you think you know it all, we discover something like this that just turns everything upside down and we have to go right back to the drawing board and figure out, wait a minute, what's going on here? This isn't the way we thought it was at all. That always happens. And it usually happens right about the time when we think we know everything, which is the reason why I always harp on it. Maintain your objectivity, right? Because I guarantee you, we do not have it yet, right? We don't know what we think we know. That's just the way it works. That's just the way science works. Right? So that's, uh, I, love, I love that one because it's just, it's exciting, right? So you can see that if you're maintaining your objectivity, I mean, these discoveries, they don't feel threatening or scary. They feel exciting and exhilarating. It's like, whoa, that is gonna be awesome. I mean, I'm super, super excited and stoked to see where this whole T-Rex soft tissue discovery thing goes and how far widespread it is to see if it's a thing or if it's just some weird little, you know, anomaly. Either way, finding it at all is just, whoa. I mean, that's like finding human remains in like Precambrian sediment. That shouldn't be possible, right? And that's what's so fascinating and fun about it because it forces us to kind of step back and be like, we need to rethink this. And when we figure, and when we kind of redo this, it's going to be stronger than it was before. That's the great thing I love about it, right? It's like a revision. We do this all the time in science, but we have to make sure we are objective when we do it. Good. Uh, I have the paper in my office. I know as a researcher in North Carolina, I want to say it was between five and 10 years ago. Um, oh, it's still growing. It's just beginning. I mean, this is so like, this is so like flagrant. This is like, so like impossible that it's gonna take some time, right? Usually when you have scientific discovery kind of challenges the way we think things are, you usually go through a long period of denial. <laughs> That's the way science is because scientists are in love with their idea. They often are biased. They try to downplay that, but they often are. And it takes them some time and it takes multiple experiments before they finally say, you know what? You keep dropping that pen and it keeps going down. And even though I thought it would go up, the more you drop it and the more I see it go down, eventually I'm gonna to have to admit that, yeah, I think you're onto something here, right? So yeah, where that goes is gonna be, I mean, it's gonna be fascinating. Um, and obviously those, usually those researchers um, are hailed with lots of criticism. You know, it's like, oh, well, this is, you did this wrong or you did that or, and that's usually where it starts. And then eventually, I think there's been more than a, a, like about two or three labs now that have, followed suit and used her same um, methods. And they've found, like, I don't think she found collagen. She found 
uh, red blood cells. And then another lab found collagen. Um, and so the other people are starting to find some things now. Um, so that's kind of what sort of makes it interesting is it wasn't just one person who's just kind of, you know, being crazy. Um, it looks like there's a couple of people now that are starting to find it, but we don't know what to make of it, right? So usually now we're kind of in the proceed with caution mode. It's like, you're asking us to basically rewrite everything we learned. That's a big ask, right? So, you know, those are pretty big claims. You need to have pretty big evidence for that. And that's kind of what, what's coming in. That's the process we're in now, is making sure it's like, this is not an anomaly, that this is a thing. And that takes, that can take decades uh, before the scientific community finally says, especially for something like evolution, which has been so big and people have basically spent entire careers on it. You're basically telling them, listen, your entire career <laughs> is backwards, right? That's, that's, that's a problem for a lot of people and reasonably so. so. You mean like as in the fossil you mean? Well, in the red blood cells themselves, they're, they're really not that long lived. The 120 days is not that very long. Um, that's, that's 120 days protected in your body. Outside, they're even, they'll have even a, long, a, lot, a shorter life, a shelf life. Because all they are is just like little membranes full of hemoglobin. And so for the most part, when those kind of spill out, those membranes are going to easily shred. They're not strong. So you can shred them very easily. Um, so I would probably argue that those red blood cells probably are not really all that intact. Like if I'm just bleeding all over the place. Okay. Is there gonna be a lot of red blood cells there? Yes. But the second you basically put some you know, fresh water on them, they're all gonna burst. And you're just gonna have hemoglobin soup everywhere. Right, that's pretty much what you're getting. You'll still see the, the hemoglobin will still be there. Yeah, that'll still be there. Um, and you know, uh, you can certainly test the hemoglobin and things like that. So, and everything that was in the red blood cell would technically still be there. It would just not be bundled up in that little membrane because that's what would burst. It'd be like a, it'd be like a water balloon, right? It would blow up. You'd still see the water. It'd still be sort of all over the place, but it's just, it's just not going to be all, you know, inside that little balloon. Right. So you can still test and see like, yeah, it's wet. Yeah, it's water. So you can still test the water and see what it is. Okay. Good stuff. Um, so when we take a look then at biology um, and we kind of move forward into studying these organisms, right? We already kind of wrestled with the diversity situation. But now what we want to do is want to take a look at uh, some of these properties of life. So we already know it's complicated. Right? So it's a lot more complicated than most probably biology professors let on, um, probably because they themselves haven't really thought about how complicated it is. Um, but there are certain particular properties of life, some things that you have to do. Now, what I like to do is I like to sort of re, um, re-tag this slide and call this one the big biological questions of life. That's a phrase that you're going to hear me say uh, from time to time. And so what do I mean by that? So um, what I mean by that is that these are the things that all living organisms have to do. Um, you can't not do these. Yes. No problem. Right. So what are the, some of the things you have to do? You have to have some organization, right? So you have to organize yourself. Energy is a big one, right? Homeostasis, that's a big one, whatever that is. Let me know what homeostasis is. It's having a constancy of your internal uh, metrics, right? So for instance, like blood pressure, for instance, has a homeostatic range of normal within which it can kind of bounce, right? So that's homeostasis. So it's all these different parameters inside your physiology that maintain a sort of a constancy, yes.
Yes. Yes, I'm glad you asked that actually. <clears throat> because this, this list here, this is something that every single organism on the planet has to do, right? They all have to organize themselves. They all have to use energy. They all have to have homeostasis. They all have to do what? They all have to grow and develop, right? They all have heredity. They have to pass their genes on, which is one of the reasons why evolution at its heart is a genetic thing, which is the reason why I'm not a big fan of the fossil record because it's not a, it never was a fossil record thing. It's not a rock thing. It's a genetic thing. Right. And so heredity is big in understanding everything about organisms. So here's the thing. All organisms basically have. I don't know how long she's been there. Hopefully not like super forever. Um, wait, where is she? Sorry, Crystal. I just saw you. Okay, so basically the goal of every organism on the planet is what? What is the purpose of a bio? That's it. That's the bullseye. Everything else serves that purpose, right? Now, that's not your goal as a person. <laughs> we got a lot more things that going on than just that. But for an organism, propagating the species is the goal it's the purpose not only that but it is such a singular purpose that everything an organism does is pointing to and leading toward ultimately that one ultimate goal what do you need in order to reproduce let's just take this down a little bit okay yeah if you're a sexual reproducer yes you need a partner <laughs> so what do you need for your body right what? So you need the reproductive organs, right? So you need that. Yep. Proper surrounding. So let's go ahead and take a look at the organ thing, proper surrounding, right? So you want the mood music because every, you know, you don't want to put on the Barry White, you know, get it all nice and quiet at home. Um, right. Right. So what is the organs? Yes. Right, that gets to heredity. Sperm and the egg, that's down to heredity. So to develop the, pro the proper body in order to actually mechanically do the reproduction. Now, this isn't just the reproduction, right? Because it's not just about drop and go, right? I mean, this is like, you have to do reproduction, but you have to be able to do the actual mating, which means you have to actually physically be able to copulate and you need the organs to do that. But whoever is carrying the offspring also has to have the physiological body and capacity to carry the offspring, to have the labor, right? Um, and it's like, if you're an egg layer, you have to be able to have the physiological capacity to be able to, uh, yes, thank you very much. It is the vagina, uterus, and pretty much everything else. Ovaries are also helpful. Um, can't go very far without that one. Right, but pretty much all of the reproductive organs are necessary for copulation, right? The uterus, the womb, is required for incubation, right? Which is basically the first nine months gestation. But you need that too, right? Unless you're an egg layer, then you just drop the eggs and go. But those are two different strategies, aren't they? We've just described the difference between a mammal and a non-mammal. But are they both reproducing? Yes. Did they answer their question? Yes. Did they do it differently? Yes. Does that create diversity? Yes. Question. Yes, and that's actually a fascinating observation. The environmental effects on uh, a couple of things, on reproduction, number one, um, and also genderification. Right? There are some organisms, reptiles, for instance, that will do gender switching based on temperature. Um, 
and there are some and so there's there's a so that's a whole that's a fascinating um sort of rabbit trail within that whole reproductive strategy but what did they do they came up with some sort of a strategy that works for them did they reproduce yeah did they success successfully achieve their purpose in life yes was it crazy was it wild yeah it was a little on the wild side but it worked right and that's all that matters in order to get your reproductive organs you have to develop them yes okay here's the, here's the thing when you're born guess what females you've got all the eggs you'll ever have in your life they're already there you've got your reproductive organs you've got your ovary you've got your uterus you've got everything so why don't you just start having kids right there, right there boom brand new baby haven't even grown your hair in yet right why not just start having kids right there you got your reproductive organs don't you they developed didn't they are you ready to have kids when you're two months old? When are you ready to have kids? Not psychologically, biologically. Question. Bingo, right? The female body is biologically capable of reproduction the second puberty hits and all the hormones start to rush in and you start to go on your monthly cycle where you are going through follicular development, right? That is basically the maturation of those eggs and the availability of those eggs for fertilization. The second that happens, you are ready. When does that happen? Yeah, depending on the individual, right? So there's a bit of a range, but uh, middle schoolish ish around there um, is about then. Um, is it advised for middle schoolers to have a bunch of kids? Why not? You're biologically ready. Psychologically, you're not ready to go. Yes. It depends on the era, it depends on the culture. So there is some. There is some plasticity there, right? But just kind of going from what we know, for the most part, from our culture, that is true, right? So that is one thing. Go ahead, question. Yeah, yeah, and that's also, right? So what are you doing then? Are you developing? Are you really, or are you doing this one? When you're born, you got everything you need. Everything just gets bigger. So why does your body make you wait until middle school or puberty to be able to do your ultimate biological goal, which is to reproduce? Don't you think that the brain and psyche might be yeah well let's let's do that let's do a thought experiment right let's go and say let's say that let's kind of zoom this forward a little bit let's say that a five-year-old is biologically capable of having a baby is that going to be a successful situation there? Why not? Bingo, right? Because it's not just about dropping and going because we're not egg layers, right? We're mammals. So one of the things we have to do is now tying the shoes, right? But let's go ahead and get real with an animal. If you've got an organism that is having a kid and they themselves don't know how to defend themselves against the lion, then are they gonna defend their baby against the lion? Basically that lion is looking at, hey, buy one, get one. This is awesome, right? The middle schooler, is the middle schooler going to be able to defend themselves against the lion? No. I know too many middle schoolers to know that they are not there yet. However, when you're 18 or 21, when you stop growing, are you gonna be able to defend that baby? 
Yeah, depending on who you are, but for the most part, yes. Why? Because you have grown larger in body. More importantly for us, our strategy is here. You've also learned a few things. Why? Because when you were five, you'd never seen a lion before. But as you're growing up into middle school, you've seen mom or dad fight that lion off. So you've learned a few tricks. Oh, well, you know, dad got eaten. So I'm not going to try this strategy anymore. But mom had a great idea. So I'm going to take that one. I'm going to add to it. By the time you get up to the age of 18, you've seen a lot of that. And you have some tricks and techniques. So you can basically take a look at that line and look at it and be like, you know what? I, I own you. I own you because you don't know what you're doing. And I actually know what you're doing. Not only that, but I know what you're going to do. I'm playing like four dimensional chess and I'm 16 moves ahead of you. Why? Because of this, because you've been watching your own parents struggle and survive throughout life. And now you can apply that to protecting your own baby. Well, there's a genetic reason for that. Uh, because your frequency and your probability of getting a Down syndrome baby of non disjunction, that is to say that the eggs don't actually go through cell division um, as faithfully as you get older, um, becomes a bigger problem. Right. Um, and so, like your eggs when you are 25 are um, stronger and more robust than your eggs at 55. Because when you're 55, those eggs have been in stasis for five decades. And it's kind of like holding up something heavy. If you're there for five hours, you're going to be in much worse shape than if you're only there for one. Right? That's the same idea. That's the reason why we consider 35 the crisis pregnancy point. Good. Uh, Do I? Oh, thank you very much. Oh, Crystal came back in. Okay, so. Yeah. It was 40, but it is, they're moving it down. Um, 35 is now the thing. So if you're 35, they automatically categorize you as, a, as an at-risk pregnancy. And they keep very close tabs on you because our numbers are getting better uh, in terms of following the frequency of, of these uh, non-disjunctional events in older mothers. Yeah. How recent was that I would say within the last 10 years, um, because my youngest one, I think my wife was 37 and she was automatically red flagged um, when we had our son. Um, so it's been within the last 10 years, at least. It could have been even before that. Um, the little guy is six. So they're six, eight, and 10. So. Yeah, so they keep me busy, right? But so basically what that means is, in order to reproduce successfully, you've got to develop successfully, which is the reason where the Down syndrome thing comes in, right? Because you're not developing successfully, it's a developmental issue, as well as a genetic issue. Um, and you also have to grow, right? You have to grow to the point where you can actually do what? Not just reproduce, but? Survive. Survive. Everything you do for survival, which is a lot, all ultimately goes to what? Reproduction, because if you're not alive long enough on this planet, you're never going to reproduce, you fail, right? So everything you do for survival is leading to reproduction. Okay, here's a good idea. Great, we can, we can swallow that one. So what do we need in order to grow and develop, right? We need to do that, fine, I'll take, you with, I'll take, I'll take that and we'll push back on that one. What do you need for that? Well, first of all, in order to grow and develop, you need some sense of normalcy, physiological normalcy. It can't be like the stock market. It can't be like, you know, at nine o'clock, you're going to be way up here at 930, way down here. You can't be like on a super high and then, and then, and then, right. You can't do business like that. What you need is some stability. Yes. Look at finances. A lot of your portfolios are designed to be largely stable, regardless of what the market is doing. 
with varying amounts of risk, yes? So you kind of expose yourself to varying degrees to risk. So the idea of entire financial investing is all predicated on a homeostasis idea. Take the wild fluctuations, smooth them out and create a constant normalcy within which we can do business, right? And that's exactly what homeostasis is. What that does, it creates a normal environment that's stable so that you can develop and grow and reproduce and survive, right? So that's all part of that. So you need homeostasis to do your development and growth. Question in the back. You good? Okay. Okay, so that's great. So we need to grow and develop. We establish a sort of a normal constant, right, in our homeostasis. So now what? Now what do we need? Well, first of all, we need to organize this, right? So organizing our activities, because growing is going to, there's going to be a lot to that, right? So everything's going to be growing. Same thing with development. So you don't just want to do it, right? You want to organize it. Uh, it's kind of like saying growth and development is sort of like saying win the football game. Oh, that's great. How do you manage in doing that? Well, what do you do with the football game to win it? You game plan, don't you? You come down with an organization of how exactly you're going to do it, right? So you have different strategies. If you're a football fan, right, this is where kind of Nathaniel Hackett obviously failed, um, right? But when you come to clock management, you have a plan, an organization to say, if we find ourselves in this condition, this is what we do, okay? If we're third and long, these are the plays we go for, okay? If we're in the red zone, this is what we're doing. If we're fourth and one, these are our options, okay? So you organize everything so that you can be successful. Same thing's also true here. If you need to grow and develop, you have to organize your cell in order to be able to do it. Ah, uh, but... Here's the kicker. Do you get any of this for free? No. It is always true, right? That anything in life worth doing is never free. Free stuff fundamentally has no value. And technically has no value, right? So if it's trash, it's trash. I've never been a big fan of one man's trash than another man's treasure. No, it's trash. It's actually just trash right? Why? Because even if we do pick it up and let's say it's a brand new saw table that somebody puts out on the curb because they don't want it anymore, whatever, and it works wonderfully. The idea is not necessarily, you know, was it a treasure? The idea was, you know, what is its value to me, right? Because if it's free, it has no value. It didn't have any value to the person who owned it. And um, it's not going to have as much value to me because I got it for nothing, right? The things we get for free, we don't respect. The things we have to work our butts off for, we honor because we have a very clear history of like, man, you know what? I bled for you and I cherish you, right? It's like that car that you have to save up a lifetime for. And you finally get to the point where you have enough money to buy your sports car. And you treat that thing like it is your firstborn, right? If you had millions of dollars and you just happened to go out on a whim and buy that car, do you respect it as much? No, it's probably one sports car in an entire garage of sports cars. And you probably don't even know you have it half the time, right? So it has no value. So that's the idea. So nothing comes for free. So what do we need then in order to get this entire process started? As a matter of fact, this is the first step in all of this. Everybody needs an energy plan. The energy plan sets the foundation. Why? Can you reproduce if you don't have any energy? No, not gonna happen. Can you develop if you don't have any energy? Not gonna happen. Can you grow if you don't have any energy? We know that one for sure, right? Because how many of you guys, if you're still teenagers, you're probably already here, but if you pass the teenage years, if you remember when you're a teenager, you pretty much ate everything that was not nailed down. That's so true, right? 
And it's like, you eat everything and your parents are like, what the hell, right? And then you like start eating like the carpet. And I mean, it just doesn't stop, right? It's like ravenous wolves, right? Are there, been there? Why? Why you're consuming so much? Energy, why? Because a teenager is in, during one of the most active growth periods of our life cycle, right? When you're in your teenage years. That's the reason why you have those growing pains uh, for those of you who went through those like really fast growth spurts, uh, but you're like just voracious. I mean, you can't eat enough. You're constantly eating. Why? Because you need that energy in order to support your growth and development. You don't get it for free. Homeostasis, do you get that one for free? No, you don't. Because constancy is not a thing. You have to actually create proteins and things like that. Little, little guards, if you will that keep all these things nice and even. It's like basically having to hire an adult in the room to keep all the toddlers in line, right? So that costs money, right? Because nobody's gonna do that one for free unless it's their own kids. If it's somebody else's kid, you better be paying them and there better be hazard pay as well, right? So that costs money to maintain that constancy. And there's a lot of homeostasis in the biological organism that creates that constancy. Organization, does organization come for free? No, you know how I know? Do this experiment, very quick, ex easy experiment. Clean your room. Was that energy free? No, it cost you something, didn't it? That's organization, organization costs, right? So basically all these things cost something, including heredity, right? Which is the natural outcome, the generational outcome of reproduction. Question. So like if you're talking about initial organism, like structure building, uh, if you're talking about like structure building, um, that's something that uh, obviously you're building up for a reason, right? Um, and so that obviously goes somewhere. So there's some consequences or some capacities that you're trying to build that is the outcome of that organization. Um, and that's that other piece, that's kind of where that, and if you need more organization or if you need to control all that stuff, then that's even more expense where you have to kind of control everything, right? So like if I want to use like the daycare idea, I have both the, I need to be able to build the organization of the daycare room, right? I need to sort of, some rooms are appropriate for daycare, some are not, right? This it would not be an appropriate space for daycare. We'd have to gut this, kind of lay down some carpet, make, you know, put some little fuzzy little animal pictures all over, spread some toys around. We'd have to change all that. That's structure building, that's cellular organization. But then in addition to that, Actually, the operational costs, once we do that initial build out, is also a cost as well. So then we have to hire all the daycare workers to be able to manage all the kids and things like that nature. And that is a constant cost as well. So they're kind of, they all sort of, sort of merge together, basically. Um, and when you're economizing, by the way, if you don't have a good energy plan, all of this is at stake, right? All this is at risk. So the reason why I call these the big biological questions of life is because these things are something that every single organism on the planet has to answer. Every single organism has to answer this. However, they can do it however they wish. There is no requirement for how they do it, just that they do it. So ultimately in life, your requirement as a biological organism is to reproduce. That's it. How you do that, is up to you. If you want to do the whole gender switching thing with temperature, it works. Success, right? Uh, however you want to do that, that's, that's up to you. And every organism has a different way of satisfying these requirements. That's where we get our diversity from. Everybody does it differently. Question? Do I see something flash over here? No. Okay. So those, and the reason why I say that and I kind of stop on that one a little bit is because throughout the semester, 
I will oftentimes bring up those big biological questions of life, right? That's uh, something I constantly bring up because a lot of times we'll get bogged down in the minutia of mechanisms and processes. And a lot of times it gets very easy to say like, what, what, how does this fit everything? Right. And sometimes what I'll do is I'll back out and I'll say like, okay, what are we doing? In there? It's not just doing stuff, right? This is the big biological question we're trying to satisfy here. There's a reason this is going somewhere basically, right? It all pulls together. Everything an organism does all connects together within the framework of those big biological questions. And the reason why I like to point that out is because, because energy, everything takes energy, right? Energy is hard to come by, right? Kind of like money these days. <laughs> it's hard to come by. So there is no such thing as discretionary spending at a cellular level. If you see something there, it is there for a reason. The structures, the mechanisms, the processes in biology are intentional and they are purposeful. Okay. Another disagreement point that I have oftentimes with my um, evolutionary colleagues. To say that it has no function is lazy to me okay. because it's expensive. And just like I can't afford to maintain something like, uh, for instance, subscribe to a streaming channel that nobody watches, I don't have that kind of extra money. Guess what I'm going to do? I'm going to cancel it, right? Because I don't have extra money to spend on something that's not used. The cell is the same way. It spends money, energetic capital on only the things that it uses. And if it use, if it's there, it's, it's doing something purposeful because it's expensive not to okay um so a couple of things so cellular organization obviously is uh one of the top of our list right this is kind of like when we're talking about eukaryotes in particular organizing things into organelles we'll talk more about that actually in chapter four energy utilization so these are the energetic chapters remember the subject of the take-home exam that we mentioned uh before on the first day so that's what the energetics and the energy uh, strategies we'll have a lot more to say about that actually going forward Homeostasis, we don't really talk a whole lot about homeostasis, but you do get that a lot in AMP for those of you moving on into pre-health tracks and you're gonna be moving into AMP1 um, as your next class. So you talk a lot about homeostasis. That's always going on in the background. Obviously your growth development and reproduction is kind of like the bullseye of all biological organisms. So that's kind of something that's always going on, of course, heredity. So if you reproduce successfully, you're basically passing your traits on to the next generation who will then pass their traits on to the next generation and so forth. And that's heredity. So heredity essentially is moving your traits from one generation to the next, okay? And by the way, not just moving your traits onto the, to one generation to the next, but also moving all of the changes that you have acquired or rather um, uh, in your, Gametes, that is to say, in your sex cells, right? Your egg and sperm. So if there's any mutations that you have, you're also passing those on, right? And the reason why I say that is because that's the reason why we say that evolution at its heart is a genetic thing, not a paleontological thing, um, because you are passing genes on to the next generation. And if those genes get altered for one reason that you pass on, then that is a change in that gene. And then going forward, that is essentially a genetic change over time from generation to generation. That's basically molecular evolution. Good. No. Um, so you're born with all the eggs you have. So your eggs are yours. Um, what you have is in each one of your eggs, or sperm, by the way, guys, you're not off the hook here. Um, you have the chromosomes from everybody who came before you. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about that when we get into the meiosis chapter um, about genetic variation, right? So we usually think about getting our genes from our parents, and that's true, but your parents get it from their parents, which means that the, what you get and what you have right now is not just from your mom and dad, but it's what they got from their mom and dad as well. So that's how that kind of line of descent works. So we are basically repositories of the genetic information of everybody who is related to us all the way back. But it's not just a straightforward impartation, it's scrambled. So it's like mom got a deck of cards from 
grandma and grandpa. And what she does is she shuffles the cards and then gives you a particular outcome of that shuffling. That's one egg. She shuffles those cards again, and that one is one of your siblings. She shuffles the cards again, and that one is another sibling. For as many siblings as you have. Same thing's happening in death. Correct. So the sorting out and the randomizing of all of those genes is basically heredity. In chapter 12, we'll talk a lot about the, you know, the, the heredity, how, you're, how that's happening, how that's mixing up and, and, and things of that nature. So, which I love. So um, looking forward to that one. It sounds like you guys have some natural fascination with some of that. So we'll, we'll run with that. Okay, so we're already at a witching hour. So what we'll do is, this is a good place to start. We'll talk a little bit about um, hierarchical organization of, uh, of matter. And then um, we'll kind of continue to uh, move forward and we'll finish uh, chapter one, probably in maybe a class session or two. So it'll take, probably take a few, okay? Sound good?